All right, good to see everybody here this evening, and uh, hey, and we're, we're enjoying our three days of spring. All right, take your Bible this evening if you would, please. Let's go to the book of Jonah. Jonah chapter 4 this evening. Jonah chapter 4. Verse number 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish. For I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth thee of the evil. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Doest thou well to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city, and there made him a booth and sat under it in the shadow till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass when the sun did arise that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted and wished in himself to die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. Now, Father, we ask you to add your blessing to the reading of our Scripture here tonight. And Lord, as we uh, look to this closing chapter of Jonah to glean some truths from it that will help us, Lord, I pray you'll remind us as we started these, these studies weeks ago that we would remind ourselves that we are Jonah. I am Jonah. And that these things we see in his life and the lessons you wanted to teach him or lessons you would teach us. And so, Lord, I pray you would teach us this evening. Help me as I bring the study and please help the people as they listen. May your will be accomplished in each and every heart and life. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. You know, uh, I think if you're like me, I like it when stories have happy endings. I like it when the good guy wins. And uh, he beats the bad guy and rides off, uh, the good guy rides off in the sunset. You know, he gets the girl and they ride off and everybody lives happily ever after. And uh, that's not what quite happens in the book of Jonah. Uh, chapter 3 is great. I mean, it's, it's amazing the revival that took place. Remember, reading chapter 3, it was from the king all the way down to animals. I mean, everybody was in sackcloth, everybody was repenting. Everybody got right with God. It was an amazing, amazing revival. Well, then everybody ought to be happy. But not everybody's happy. Jonah's not happy. Jonah and God are not on the same page at all. And it reminded me of a new resident moving into the community. It wasn't Rob. But new resident moving in, and a guy was walking down the street, Brother Rob, and he noticed a man was struggling with the washing machine at the doorway of his house. So he offered to help him. And, of course, homeowner was overjoyed to get some help. And so the two men began working on the, that bulky appliance, trying to get it inside the house. One, one guy was inside the house. The other guy was out on the porch, and they're, they're struggling. And after several minutes of not getting anywhere, they both just stopped and looked at each other. And the homeowner finally said, I'm never going to get this thing in here. And the guy who helped him said, get it in. I thought we were taking it out. <laughs> Hope you had better help than that when you were moving. But, you know, 
they weren't on the same page. You understand? And Jonah and God were not on the same page. You know why? Jonah's angry. Jonah, you, you imagine that? A prophet of God preaching the message that God told him to preach. The people respond. The people repent. And he's mad. In fact, he's more than mad. He's extremely angry. Now, before you get too upset with Jonah, I'm gonna, yeah, don't, don't answer out loud, but have you ever been angry with God? You ever gotten upset with God? And kind of been angry with Him? And I would say the very reasons Jonah got angry are the same reasons we get angry. And the number one reason that Jonah got angry with God was because of pride. Pride. It displeased Jonah exceedingly. Verse number 1. And he was very angry. In his anger, he prays. I guess it's always good to pray. I'm not so sure. I'm glad that even sometimes when you're angry and pray that God is careful not to answer all our prayers. Jonah, when he prays, he reveals some things. He revealed what he feared about God while he was still back in Israel. He said, O oh Lord, notice what he said in verse 2, O oh Lord, when I pray Thee, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? I mean, isn't this what I thought would happen? Therefore, this is why I ran away. This is why I fled to Tarshish. This is why I didn't want to come here. He revealed why he fled from God. He revealed what he found out about God. What did he say? I know that thou art a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. He said, I know you're a gracious God. I know you're a God of pity. You're merciful. You're a God of patience. You're slow to anger. You're a God of provision. You're of great kindness. You're a God of principle. You repentest thee of the evil. And so, and, and, and he said, well, if you... And then he asked God to take his life and kill him. Better for me to be dead than alive. There's, some, there's somebody who's pretty angry. And by the way, I, I would read that and I'd say, well, I probably agree with you, Jonah. Good thing I'm not God, huh? Don't say amen to that, but thank you. So God asked him a question in verse 4. You know, sometime when you study your Bible, you ought to just study the questions God asks. You can learn a lot from the questions that God asks. And here God asks him a question. Verse 4, Doest thou well to be angry? Basically, what is he asking Jonah? Why are you angry? What are you, what are, you have any good reasons? To be angry? In other words, do you understand God doesn't ask our permission to do what He wants to do? And God doesn't need our permission to do what He wants to do. God doesn't ask my blessing or your blessing. So why is that? Because He's God and I'm not. He's the Creator and I'm the creation. So, and it's interesting, Jonah never does answer God. At least it's not recorded for us here in the Bible. So here's what Jonah does. Verse 5, you read, Jonah goes out of the city and sits on the east side of the city and makes him a little booth there and he sits under its shadow till he might see what would become of the city. What's going on in the city? Revival. <laughs> People are repenting in sackcloth and ashes and he doesn't want to have any part of it. He goes out of the city. He doesn't want to be around it. He sits out there waiting to see what's going to happen in the city. Let me ask you a question. What would he like to see happen? Yeah, he'd like to see the fire and brimstone fall is what he'd like to see. And he'd want to be in it when it happens. He wants to be a good distance away when it happens. But that's what he wants to see. And, and he just wants to have a front row seat when it happens. Now three things happen. God prepares a gourd it comes up over Jonah and it gives him shade. Shade over his little booth that he builds. Kind of a respite from the sun. So he likes that. Until God prepares a worm that's going to eat the gourd. And it's going to dry up. 
And then God appoints a scorching east wind. And it beats upon, the, the sun beats upon Jonah's head until he faints. And again, in verse 8, he wishes himself to die, that it's better for me to die than to live. It's interesting. All three of those things, the gourd, the worm, and the wind, they all came from God. He appointed each one of those things. And he liked the gourd because that gave him comfort. He didn't like the other two things because it made him uncomfortable. Okay? And so, he, he doesn't get less angry at God. He gets more angry at God. Let me ask you the question. Do you only love God when He gives you what you want? When you like what He does for you? Jonah, do you only love God when He gives you what you want? When you like what He does for you? Do you only love God when things are going well? And you like the way things are? Or when they go like we think they should? Do you love God even when the storms of life come crashing down upon you? What I think is happening here in the book of Jonah is in Jonah 3, chapter 3, God saves Nineveh. But in chapter 4, He's trying to save Jonah. And He's trying to save Jonah from himself. Now, let me help you understand something about salvation. This, the writer of Hebrews says, how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation we have a great salvation there's there's really three aspects to our salvation i am i am tonight i am saved that's a bible word i'm saved okay and and that is a word there's a bible word called justification therefore being justified by faith we have peace with god romans chapter 5 so i'm justified in the sight of god that happens the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your Savior, you're justified in the sight of God. You are, you are declared not guilty in God's sight. It's a legal term. And by the way, once you've been declared not guilty for the crimes against you, you cannot be tried for those crimes again. That's why, that's why once you've been justified in the sight of God, it is impossible for you to lose your salvation. Because it's, it's, you would be tried for the same crimes again, and even our legal system won't let that happen. And certainly God's legal system would not let that happen. So you're justified. I am saved. But there's another aspect of salvation by the which I am still being saved. That is called sanctification. That's an ongoing process in each one of our lives where I'm continually being more set apart to God. That is a continual process. And, and we're growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that's a process. The final stage of our salvation is our glorification. That's when we'll get rid of this body and we'll get a glorified body. That's glorification. This, this corruptible is going to put on incorruptible. This mortal is going to put on immortality. See? And we'll get a new body. And then we'll have complete salvation. And so, that's why the Bible says it's God which works in us both to will and to do of His good pleasure. When you come to know Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit of God takes up residence in your heart, in your life, and, and He begins to give you desires to want to do what God wants. The reason you're in church, why are you in church on Wednesday night? What kind of a nut are you? You know, who goes to church on Wednesday night? Who would want to go to church on Wednesday night? Well, that want to didn't come from you. That want to comes from God. It's God which works in me both to will and to do of His good pleasure. I don't only want to do what I do for God in His power, but I have to give God the credit that I want to do it. See, God, that's God working in you. And by the way, that's an assurance that you belong to Him. Because He gives you those desires to want to please Him. And so, God is at work in our lives. He's not finished with anybody in the room yet. Okay, He's not finished with your life. You're still breathing. You're still here. 
Uh, and so God still has a work that He wants to do in you and through you. And, and we know from Romans 12 that He accomplishes His work in us by the transforming or the renewing of our mind. He gets us to begin to think differently. You know, go back to Wednesday night church. You know why you're here? Because you think differently now than what you used to think. Used to be someone, if someone, before you were saved, somebody said, hey, why don't you go to church with me on Wednesday night? You just said, what? What are you talking about? Maybe Sunday. But even that's hard. You see? But your thinking begins to change. I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, and they were talking about something on a Saturday night. They were saying, well, but we, we want to end it early because Sunday morning's church. And we don't want to be up too late on Saturday night. Well, that's not the way they, the way they would have thought a few years earlier. But now that they're saved, they say, well, now, now I think differently. See? And that's God beginning in that process of changing our thinking because once our thinking changes, our living changes. You see? Uh, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So your thinking changes, then your living changes. And that's what God does. God's working in us and working through us. God, God knows how to deal with sinners. He knows how to deal with folks and get them to repent. But i got news for you. He knows how to deal with people who have a holier-than-thou attitude too. He knows how to deal with the proud, righteous Pharisees as well. And He knows how to deal with them. And so, he's, he's in. God is in the life-changing business. You didn't get saved just to miss hell. God saved you to change your life. God changed your life so you can fellowship with Him. And you can have a relationship with Him. That's the reason you're saved. Getting us ready for heaven. So, how do, we, how do I know I'm being changed? How do I know that God's working in me? How do I know that He's changing me from a proud, self-centered person? person to one that loves him and one that wants to do God's will for my life. You know how I know that? I know that when I start loving the things that God loves. When I start loving the things that God loves, God's doing something in my life. When I start loving his word because he gave me his word, when I start loving the people of God because he said I should love the people of God, I start having a heart for the things that God has a heart for, then I know that God's changing me to be what He wants me to be. He's molding us and making us like the potter with the clay. It's really interesting. Jonah's pride. And we'll see how, what that led to here in just a minute. But it's kind of interesting. The whole book ends kind of abruptly. Do you think? I mean, verse 11, God ended it with a question. He said, Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle? And I want to turn the page saying, Okay, where, where's the rest of it? <laughs> uh, there's got to be more to it here. And, 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 of course, the answer is simply, Yeah, absolutely. Yes, God should spare Nineveh. Because God loves people. He cares about people. God so loved the world. That's not the, that's not the globe. That's people. He so loved us that He gave His only begotten Son. But you see the, the great difference here between God and Jonah. It's a great difference. God loves people Jonah didn't. Jonah loved the, the, the gourd. He loved his comfort. He loved getting his way. He loved doing things that he wanted to do. He would rather be comfy and cozy, sleeping on a ship, going away from Nineveh, than seeing Nineveh repent. He didn't care about Nineveh repent. He cared more about a plant, a gourd, than he did a people. Did Jonah, did he ever come around? We don't know. Just It stops. Doesn't say if he ended up getting his life right with God or not. It just leaves us wondering. 
We don't know. We'll have to wait till we get to heaven to find that out. But that's why he was angry. He was angry because he was very proud. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Yea, these six things does the Lord hate. Yea, seven are an abomination to Him. A proud look, number one. He hates a proud look. Pride is the first sin that Lucifer ever committed that got him thrown out of heaven. I will be like God. I will sit on His throne. I will. And pride. Boy, every, every believer is born with such a prideful sin nature. Don't, don't, it's, you kind of waste your breath if you say, boy, preacher, pray for me. I really struggle with pride. Well, welcome to the human race. That's that, that's, that's that sin nature that's in each one of us. We want everything to revolve around us. That's why, that's why some of your, your health and wealth preachers and your television guys get, get so rich. What are they telling them about? Your best life now. You can have it all now. You know, that, that, that you're this and you that and it all rolls around you. And that's why churches sometimes get, get large crowds come. You know why? Because that we'll give you whatever you want. Tell us what you want in church. You want the rock band? You want the strobe lights? You want all that? Hey, we'll give it to you. Come on, whatever you want. And, and people eat that up. Why? Pride. But God says, I resist the pride. You won't find, do a study in your Bible sometime. Look up pride and proud. Every mention in the Bible. Get a good concordance, a strong concordance, something. Every time the word pride or proud is used in the Bible, it's never used in a good light one time. Never. Never. I try to, I try to avoid it at all costs. I, I, I try even not to tell, I try even not to say, well, I'm proud of you. I don't even want to say that. In fact, God didn't say that. He said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He ne God never looked down and said, Jesus, I'm proud of you. He said, I'm pleased. Maybe that's a good word to replace pride with. I'm so pleased about that. I'm so pleased you did that. That takes some training, Mom and Dad, to get used to, especially with your children. Because we're so used to saying to our children, I'm proud of you. Be careful. I don't want to give, I don't want to give pride a, an inch because it'll take a mile, okay? And so pride, pride. The second thing that Jonah and God were on the same page about and the second reason Jonah was angry was because of his prejudice. Uh-oh. Pride and prejudice. Is that a book? Pride and prejudice. As we said, Joan ought to be happy, he ought to be thrilled, but he's not. He's very angry for God showing mercy. He's angry with God for showing compassion. He's angry with God. You know why? Because he was merciful and he was compassionate to those people. Those guys. He's angry that God didn't destroy them. Jonah thought they should have been destroyed. He's really angry with God acting like God and not like Him. See, Jonah had his own ideas. He had his own ideas about the people of salvation. Who should be saved, who shouldn't be saved. He had his own ideas about the place of salvation. He had his own ideas about the plan of salvation. And if we're not careful, we have to understand we're all subject to that. We're all subject to our prejudices. We look at people with colored glasses. Oftentimes, it's very difficult for us to relate to people who are different than we are. It can be cultural. It can be racial. It could just simply be some preferences. But prejudice is always based on a preconceived notion. We've already prejudged. That's why it's called prejudice. Prejudicial. We've already passed the judgment before we ever even know the person or talk to the person. 
You know, in the Bible, there was prejudice between the Jews and the Samaritans. Hated each other. The Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, they never even go through Samaria. If they, if they could, to, they'd go around it. They'd take the long way around rather than cut through. That's why the woman at the well was so shocked when Jesus was there and wanted to have a conversation with her. There was even a bigger divide between the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews called the Gentiles dogs. Not a real endearing term. You know, when you think really highly of someone, you don't say, oh, that's my dog over there. In fact, I won't tell you that, but we won't. You understand, it was very difficult. In fact, you know it was difficult. I want you to, to go in your Bible to the New Testament to Acts chapter 10 with me, would you please? In Acts 10, you can find out God has to talk to Peter about this very thing. In Acts 10, there's a Gentile, an Italian man, Named Cornelius. He was, a, he was a devout man and he was really searching for God. And the Lord tells him in verse 4 that his prayer and his alms are come up for memorial before God. And he tells him, he said, Send men to Joppa, call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodged with one Simon a tanner, verse 6, chapter 10 whose house was by the seaside, and he shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. And when the angel spake unto, which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. And on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry. And he would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened, and a certain vessel descending unto him, as it had been a great sheet knit at four corners, and let down to the earth. Wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. And Peter said, Not so, Lord. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. The voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice. And the vessel received up again into heaven. Peter had something, Peter had something with the three time thing, didn't he? Uh, had to get it three times where he would understand it. Peter doubted it himself what this vision which he had seen should mean. Behold, the men which were sent for Cornelius had made inquiry at Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. And while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Now notice what Peter learned. Verse 28. When he gets before all of the group that Cornelius gathers together, you know what he said? He said unto them, You know how that, is not, that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. So here we are. Peter is, is having to learn to deal with his prejudices. Here's a devout, God-fearing Gentile and his family and his relatives all ready to hear the Gospel. Who is God going to send to him? A Jewish man named Peter. They're going to hear about Christ from him. I understand. That's difficult for Peter to do. That's rough for him to accept. He even tells them it was unlawful for a man that is a Jew to keep company or, or come unto one of another nation to come into his house. It's an amazing thing that here the, the disciples, this is some ten years after the ascension of Jesus Christ, and they still haven't taken the gospel to anybody but Jews. Why? Prejudice. Didn't God say? Jerusalem, Judea. What's the third place? 
Samaria. Not them. And the uttermost part of the world. Everybody. Gentiles too. You know, don't be too hard on Peter. Most American Christians find it difficult to approach someone and talk to them when they're different than we are. If they have a dressing on their head, they're dressed in different clothing than what we wear, we're fearful to talk to them. Fearful to address them. In some, in some cases, I've heard some Christians who are just flat out prejudiced and would they have the same opinion Jonah had. They just as soon God judge them and kill them. That's what Jonah wanted Ninevites. And the same reason Jonah thought that, the same reason we think that is because of pride and our prejudice. And it's wicked in God's sight. And when we leave prejudice unchecked, it becomes a huge divide. Sadly, you know, one of the most, someone said one of the most segregated times in America is at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And it should not be that way. It should not be that way. In, in Christ, we are all one. I'm going to give you three ways that you overcome prejudice. And, and by the way, I'm not sure you can be born in America without having, having battling some kind of prejudice as you grow up. Oh, it may not always be racial, though in many cases it's racial. It may be cultural. And, and in any case, anytime there's prejudice, pride is, is the partner. Because we think we're better than they are. We can see, hey, we can see prejudice in churches. In churches that have, a, that, that have an addictions program like we do. Oh, are we going to have those people come? Well, what are you talking about? Those people. Those people are us people. These, these, uh, oh, you mean, well, none of those guys who get saved in prison, they're not coming to our church, are they? Are we going to have those people come? Yeah. Yeah, Lord willing. You know why? Because those people are us people. But for the grace of God, three ways you overcome prejudice, all right? Number one, you get to see people the way God sees them. You have to see them the way God sees them. We all tend to read things from our own perspective. We're all a prisoner of our own experiences. How we have grown up. Things we've seen. And to get a true picture of things, we need to see it as God sees it. It comes back to where our thinking begins to change. Because we don't go by what we think anymore. We go by what God says. What does God say about it? What does the Bible say about it? That's what Peter was saying. Peter, you know, it's, it's interesting. Peter, Peter never had a problem. Uh, and I shouldn't say never had a problem. But it seemed to be like he was so easy to say no to God. Remember when Jesus said, I'm going to uh, uh, be betrayed in the hands of sinners, suffer many things, and die on the cross? What did Peter say? Not so, Lord. No way. When, when he was going to wash his feet? No. You're not washing my feet. It's so easy. Just those words to come out of his mouth. And he talk, here he lets the sheet down and says, rise, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. Always thought that he knows best. I'm probably a lot like Peter sometimes. God does things, and I may not say it out loud. That's how I act. Not so, Lord. And God had to tell him, don't you call anything unclean that God has made clean. Yeah, according to the law, Peter, 
You don't eat these things. But I'm transitioning you to a new period called grace. And under grace, every creature of God can be received. So the unclean are made clean, not by the law, but by grace. And so all men can be saved, not by the law, but by grace. By the grace of God. Hold your finger there in Acts 10. Look at Galatians chapter 3 with me, please. Galatians chapter 3. Aren't you glad you have a Bible to use? Galatians chapter 3. I use this verse oftentimes to give assurance of salvation in soul winning. I go to Galatians 3 and verse number 26. Notice the Bible says, For ye are all the children of God. You ever heard that? We're all God's children. But wait a minute, does the verse end there? Oh, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. When do you become a child of God? When you put your faith in Christ Jesus. Once you put your faith in Christ Jesus, you become a child of God. Now, once you're a child of God, for as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now notice, for there is, where there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. I'm just saying there's, that when God looks at each of us, He's not looking at the nationality. He's not even looking at the gender. He's looking at you as a person whom He loves and a person who Christ died for. There's no schism. There's no division. You'll find out later uh, that Peter says, God is no respecter of persons. Difficult for Peter to accept what God is teaching him. So God does it three times. Don't be too hard on Peter. How many of you have had God have to do something to you more than once to get you to get it and understand it? It's so easy to justify ourselves. To tell ourselves that we're doing all right, That I'm better than somebody else. So easy to begin to compare ourselves with somebody else. Say, well, yeah, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than, and we'll name somebody else. And we compare ourselves among ourselves, which Paul says is not very wise. Behind all prejudices is a heart that feels self righteous. But Jesus always went the other way. You don't find that attitude in Jesus at all. The, the law said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you and despitefully use you. The law said, alright, you forgive a guy seven times. And Jesus said, no, let's do it 70 times seven. And I don't think He meant Keep track till you get to 490. And then you say, 491. I don't think that's what he had in mind. Jesus said, if somebody strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. If he forces you to go one mile, say, hey, can I go two? I mean, this was, this was radical. This was unheard of. No one lived that way. You see, what I think is right may not be right. What God says is right is what's right. How I see a person may not be right. How God sees them is right. I have to see people the way God sees them. God always sees them with mercy and with grace. Number two, the second way that we can defeat prejudice is we must treat others the way we want to be treated. 
I must treat others the way I would want to be treated. The first one, I want to see others as God sees them. The second, I want to treat others as I would want them to treat me. So Peter goes and he gives the gospel to those folks at Cornelius' house. I want you to look in chapter 10 again. I, I'm not sure where I want to read this whole thing for you, but he was preaching the gospel to them. And uh, let's start verse 40, where he talks about God raised him up on the third day and showed him openly, talking about Jesus. Not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the quick and the dead. To Him give all the prophets witness that through His name... What's the next word, church? Whosoever believeth in Him shall receive remission of sins. And while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. That's the Jews. They were astonished as many as came with Peter. Why were they astonished? Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. They were astonished. Wait, wait a minute. They, they got saved just like we did. They, they, got the, they, they received Christ just like we did. They received the Holy Spirit just like we did. I guess God really did mean whosoever. He really did mean anybody can be saved. God's scope of forgiveness goes far beyond our human understanding. His grace is greater than what we could ever think or believe. And we cannot define who's worthy of God's grace and who isn't worthy of God's grace. God gave Peter and that Jewish group a clear authentication that the Gentiles are accepted into the kingdom of God just like them. No difference. God is no respecter of persons. The problem we have, one of the problems in America of the not treating each other the way we would want to be treated because in the New Testament, when Jesus taught that, do unto others as you would have them do unto you is called the golden rule. Oh, but we've thrown the Bible out. We've thrown God out. And we wonder why people don't treat each other with respect. And we don't treat each other as we would want to be treated. Well, if you're going to do that, you've got to bring the Bible back into things. And they don't want that. You're not going to go without the Bible and get the results of the Bible. You're going to get the pride and the prejudice of the human heart without God. We see people as God sees them. We treat them as we would want to be treated. And then number three, we acknowledge and accept the differences. We acknowledge and accept the differences. We read earlier in Galatians chapter 3 about we're one, we're one body in Christ. Not, not Jew and Greek and, you know, there, there's, there's, we're, we're all one. The, the ground, someone said, the ground is all level at the foot of the cross. And you know what? When you walk through the doors of a church house, the ground is all level at the church house. You may be, you may be a CEO of a company, but when you walk into church, you're just brother so-and-so. Or sister so and so. Not a you may be a big shot when you go to work Monday through Saturday, but you're just a, you're just a member of the body of Christ when you come to church, and that's the way it ought to be. There's no respecter of persons. We 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 accept and we acknowledge differences when we come together. There's not divides. There's not schisms. There's not cliques. There's not groups. 
And that's difficult. Because we all like to be around people who are like we are. Birds of a feather flock together. I knew you knew that scripture. <laughs> For those of you who don't know that, that's not in the Bible. Okay? But the principle is in the Bible. It is. There's going to be Jews. There's going to be Greeks. There's going to be uh, a bond. There's going to be free. There's going to be male. There's going to be female. All of those are going to be in the church. In the early church. But they were all one in Christ. They had all things common. Have you figured out, everybody's here old enough, to, I hope you've figured out that not everyone's like you. I know the world would be a much better place if everybody was just like you, wouldn't it? Huh? Man, if just thought like I thought and did what I wanted to, this world, we'd have this problem solved, you know? But they're not. God made us all individuals. Nineveh is people. Nineveh is your neighbor next door. Nineveh is the teller at the bank. Nineveh is the guy next to you at Walmart. Nineveh is the person you see driving down the road. Nineveh is a expectant teenager that should have known better. Nineveh is the person with all the tattoos and the piercings that you just raised your eyebrows at. Nineveh is those people that come on Friday night. You see, all those people are Nineveh. And God loves every one of them. Christ died for every one of them. God desires that each one of them. I believe when God says He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that's exactly what He meant. All should come to repentance. God loves them. Nineveh isn't just a place. Nineveh is people. Wherever you find people, you'll find Nineveh. Mixed together with the good and the bad, the light and the darkness. In fact, I think we live in Nineveh. But God loves Nineveh. Praise the Lord. He loves Nineveh. He loves people. He always has and He always will. The story there of Jonah is God wants Nineveh to be saved. Now there's one more lesson I'm going to give in Nineveh, about Jonah and Nineveh next, next Wednesday. And I'm going to deal with the subject of resentment. Jonah was also very resentful. And we're going to talk about how you can conquer resentment. There's many, many people that carry resentment around with them for things that have happened or things that have taken place in their life and they have resentment. They don't know how to get past it. We're going to talk about that next Wednesday night. Now, don't stand, don't stand yet. Uh, that's good for the study. Um, I want to discuss something with you just briefly, or at least announce it to you and see if you have any feedback for me. We, uh, Monday is uh, due for another bus inspection for our yellow bus. Most of you know, maybe some don't know, we very rarely have run that bus recently. Um, we, have, we have not had a bus ministry, so to speak, for a couple years now. Probably since, I think, maybe the third Linky child came along. Brad had worked that bus for a while, but when you have four boys six years of age and under, you don't need to be on a bus route Saturday and Sunday. Uh, he needs to be with his family. He works, I don't know how many hours a week, 50 maybe, something like that. He works a lot of hours and he works nights. And uh, Lisa mans the fort with those little boys. And uh, come, come weekends, if he ever is home, he, he needs to be with those boys too. So I, that's not a shadow on them at all. I think he's made th that's the right choice. We have no one to step up. But right now at this time that I know of, 
to say, I'll work the bus route. You know, that involves Saturday visiting. It involves being here and going out for uh, at least three hours on a Saturday and visit the route and get kids involved and get them on the bus. Then it involves getting here early on Sunday morning and riding the bus and staying after Sunday afternoon, taking the bus kids home. It's, it's a commitment of time, and, and, and right now I don't have anyone doing that. And so the question is, do, I, do we continue to just have a bus so we can say we have a bus? Put the money into it and expense. We've had a couple men going over it the last couple days trying to get it ready for inspection, and they've done some, some things to it. And um, they're, uh, just as they were wrapping things up today, the brake line broke and uh, just old. They weren't even working on the brake line. It just popped and fluid's coming out, so they have to replace the brake line and such. And all I'm saying is we've discussed it, the deacons have discussed it, and uh, we're considering selling the bus and, and the white bus as well and then get ourselves a, a nicer van, not the old kind of van, but the newer vans that you can fit people in. You know, the old-time vans, if you wanted to get in the last seat or the next to the last seat, you had to really... Well, let's just say guys like me were going to sit in the front. <laughs> okay? Uh, and some of you understand that. But the new ones aren't that way. And plus, I, 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 want, it to, I want it to be a good advertisement for our church and a good representation of our church. So I just... Uh, I wanted to throw that out there to see what, if you have any thoughts about it um, or any recommendations, I, I don't know. I'd love to, great to have bus ministry. I'd love to see 25, 30 kids come in on that bus and be here every Sunday morning. Um, but as of now, I don't know of someone who says, hey, preacher, that's, that's what we want to do. We want to be in the bus ministry. Uh, if, you're, if you're here and that's how God's prompting you, then you need to see me because uh, that would be wonderful. Uh, but if not, I don't, I don't know that we want the expense of having it and insuring it and everything else. The other thing is a diesel. We've had problems with it because if you don't run a diesel, it, it's not good for it. Uh, when it sits for two, three weeks at a time, it just uh, means there's more repairs that will have to be done to it. Uh, they're actually better when you run them. So any feedback or comment on that? I'm open to what you want to say. Good. What's that? All right. Okay. Sure. Yeah, for 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 much of those last two years or so and maybe before that, the the only ones we're picking up were Quentin and uh Susan and you know, maybe one or two others, but Sometimes yellow bus, sometimes just the white bus, but now Quentin has got a car and they drive themselves in. So we really have one lady, I think, on Sunday morning that he picks up, uh, Carol Blackwell. Uh, picks her up from the retirement home over here and brings her in. And that's the only one we're bringing right now. And uh, he can, we can do that in a van as easily as we can a 72-passenger bus. So, yeah, Don? Sure, it is a good bus. That's been a good bus for us. And really, the white bus is, what was it, $1,500? I think we got that for back when it was down on the street down there. And I mean, that was how many years ago? Four years, five years, somewhere in there, four years ago. And I mean, we've more than, more than paid for that. Uh, but it's, uh, I don't know how many miles are on that thing, but it's, it's a lot. Over 300,000? On that one, so it's uh, and it and it doesn't look very good now. It's it shows the the wear of it all. So, brother, yeah. Parish. Sure. Sure. Okay. All right. 
Cindy? Oh, sure. We will. Absolutely. That's, that's really the market who would go to. We'd have to go to a church that has a bus ministry that's looking for a bus. And we would do a, be a good deal for that. You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and if the day comes, we have someone come in and they have a burden for the bus ministry, we'll, we'll look and we'll get a bus back. Uh, that's, that's easy to do. And uh, they're out there. In fact, I had, I had someone just talk to me today uh, and, and said they knew of a guy who can, where he can get buses and he gets a great deal, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's available. Brother Bob? Yeah. Yeah. The truth is, it hadn't it hadn't been an outreach for for several years now. It just hasn't. And I don't want to just have a bus so we can say, "Well, we have a bus." Uh, that's that's just silly. So we'll uh, we'll get it fixed, and uh, we'll see if we can say maybe there's somebody on another end praying for a bus, and uh, we'll may be the answer to that prayer. We'll, uh, we'll see what will take place, okay? And uh, that's why it's sitting where it is. Don't move it. <laughs> you, you may not stop moving. <laughs> so leave it where it is, all right? All right, let's stand together and we'll have a word of prayer, okay? Father, thank you for this evening. Lord, thank you for our church family and thank you, Lord, for a, a good time together here this evening. We pray you'll lead us and guide us in the matter of this bus and the buses, Lord, and uh, give us your wisdom. Lord, we don't want to go ahead of you. We want to be led by you. And so show us exactly what we should do and give us the wisdom that comes from above to handle this matter right. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to remember we can be so much like Jonah. And God, I pray that we would realize that you love people. And Christ died for the world to be saved. And so Lord, help us not to let our pride or our prejudices get in the way of what you want to do in people's lives. And that, Lord, you may want to do through us in people's lives. And so help us to see people the way you do. Treat them the way you tell us to treat them and how we would want to be treated. Lord, I pray that we'd reach them with the gospel. We would appreciate the fact that you made us different but we're all made by you. And that you would like them to not just be creatures of God, but children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. So Lord, dismiss us now with your care. May others see Jesus in us this week. And we'll thank you for it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.